Good evening. I'm Sandra Peart, Dean of the Jepson School of Leadership Studies, and it's my pleasure to welcome you and thank you for joining us this evening. I'd like to thank our colleagues in Alumni Affairs for offering us this opportunity to get together this evening. Tonight, it's my very great pleasure to uh, reconnect with a leadership studies and a political science alumnus, uh, Ed Coletta, member of the class of 1995. For those of you who know about the history of the Jepson School, that puts him in the second graduating class of the Jepson School. For the past decade, Ed has served as group vice president for US government relations at Walgreens, where he leads the federal lobbying, lobbying and public policy activities of the nation's largest retail pharmacy chain. To give you some uh, sense of the scope of this pharmacy giant's reach, Walgreens had an estimated $80 billion in prescription revenues in 2020. It interacts with approximately 8 million customers daily, some of those in person, of course, and some of them remotely. The company has um, more than 9,000 drug stores in all 50 states of the US, uh, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the US Virgin Islands. Life for all of us changed drastically uh, roughly a year ago today. And for Ed, it changed even more so. When a phone call from the US Department of Health and Human Services asked him, for Walgreens help in setting up COVID-19 testing facilities. Three days later, Ed drove from his home to Maryland to observe an improvised drive-through testing site. And since then, he's been quite literally working around the clock. Thanks to the leadership of Ed and others, Walgreens has administered more than 4.8 million COVID tests to date and it's currently playing a pivotal role in the government's um, efforts to vaccinate a nation in the midst of this crisis like none we've ever seen. Ed, thanks very much for joining us. It's wonderful to see you. Thank and you, thank you. Yes, and thank you to our audience as well. We've had a tremendous amount of interest in this evening's program. Um, uh, I'll begin by asking Ed some questions uh, that I have in mind, and then I'm going to follow up with questions that were submitted by our audience members. So the first question I have, Ed, is really just, I'd like you to tell us a bit about your story. Can you share with us something about the timeline uh, from when Walgreens became involved to today, um, you know, working through the testing and then the vaccination process? Happy to do so. And again, thank you, Dean Pert, and thanks to the University of Richmond. Um, it's a truly an honor to be able to participate in a conversation like this with my alma mater, of which I'm very fond and very proud, as well as the Jepson School. Um, have great memories of my experiences now dating back quite a few years ago, as we were talking about earlier. It's hard to believe it's been 25 years. Oh my uh, it does, yeah, makes me feel a bit old to say that out loud, but that's where we are. So we'll just kind of go with it. Uh, so again, thanks for the opportunity. Maybe just to paint a little bit of a picture, there's probably two or three pieces I would highlight. Um, and again, I'm very fortunate to have found myself in the position over the last 12 months to be um, able to work with incredible individuals on my team, as well as with the rest of the, the company, uh, and being able to respond to a pandemic. So as you mentioned, we, we've definitely been putting in long hours and long days and as my wife and my children can attest to that sometimes meant, you know, missing a lot of meals and not being available a lot of the time. But at the end of the day, it was always for something terribly important. And so that was super fulfilling. Um, I, you know, it's, it's interesting because we're almost at almost exactly a year ago, within a week or so that this all the world changed. And I do remember getting the phone call, both from the administration, the White House, as well as from the Department of Health and Human Services saying, can Walgreens stand up COVID-19 tests? So we had some internal conversations with our CEO and other senior leaders. And um, once we kind of figured out what that exactly meant, uh, we responded that, of course, we want to be helpful as it relates to the pandemic. We were then in lockdown. The country was um, the state of Virginia, where I live, and the city of Washington, D.C., where I work, were, were in lockdown. But I was asked to go out to this, um, this, this testing facility, as you mentioned. And so this seemed super risky. Um, but my wife always super understanding said, look, this sounds like you need to be there to understand how this all works. So in, in 
very real time, I was taking pictures, I was on the phone and reporting back um, what we thought we might need to try to replicate all over the country. And as you mentioned, that work along with a bunch of different changes to state laws, federal laws, pharmacy scope of practice issues, pharma, board of pharmacy issues, now allows Walgreens and Rite Aid and Walmart and a whole bunch of other pharmacies to be able to, to do the COVID-19 test. So it's been a phenomenal ride. I, I remember after we agreed to do the testing, we were then invited to, um, to a meeting at the White House. And so um, we were on the phone with my CEO at the time, who is based in Chicago, Illinois. And the White House said, so we'd like to have you come out on Friday. And he said, sure, next Friday, that sounds great. And they said, no, we mean tomorrow. <laughs> so within 24 hours, um, he made his way here to Washington. And that was uh, ended up being on March the 13th, which we didn't know at the time. But as we arrived on the White House complex, um, and we started to do some of the meetings about, um, so my CEO was going to meet with the president, talk about testing. They were going to do a brief press announcement. We were also then told that it was likely the president was going to be invoking um, the National Emergencies Act as well as the Stafford Act. And so that day just became more wild and more historic and more crazy. We find ourselves spending, I think, the better part of five or six hours at the White House. We had to craft a new statement on behalf of the company in light of some of the things that changed throughout the day. Um, and then we spend a fair amount of time in the Rose Garden, which is not a place I expected to frankly ever find myself, let alone in the middle of the pandemic. So uh, again, truly historic. We then got through testing, worked like heck to change, as I mentioned, a number of laws so we could do this in states all over the country. Um, now I'm really, really proud to report that in all 50 states, uh, and including Puerto Rico, we're able to do COVID-19 tests. And none of that was possible uh, 12 months ago. So from there, then we kind of got through the end of May and got into the summer months. Um, things were a bit better from a work perspective and doing a little bit more of a regular schedule, getting to see the family and, and, and do some things like that. And then as we got over you know, through Labor Day, the vaccine um, issue obviously popped. And again, we were then reached out to a second time by the administration saying, can, can you help administer these vaccines? So Walgreens and CVS um, were asked to participate in the long-term care program. That kicked off finally in late December. Um, but one of the kind of key highlights there, we ended up hosting the Operation Warp Speed leadership team back at headquarters in Chicago, Illinois. And um, I've been super fortunate in my time here in Washington to be around a lot of really interesting and well-credentialed and impressive folks and presidents and members of Congress and governors, et cetera. But I'd never been around a four-star general. And um, to say that um, that individual had a commanding presence is an understatement. And the team at Walgreens had put together basically a two hour briefing to explain how we thought we would go about administering the vaccine in long-term care facilities. And he got finished and he looked across the room and he said, you all are ready. He said, not because of anything you said, but because I can tell by the way that you presented oh, and the good. confidence that you have that you're ready to do this mission. And I think we all got chills. Uh, it, was, it was pretty neat to hear that. He, this um, general, General Perna had actually been in the Middle East and has um, managed and run many conflicts and hundreds of thousands of troops. So to hear that from him was was a pretty neat compliment to the whole company. So, you know, we're now obviously in close to the end of phase one here of vaccine administration, getting into phase two. And hopefully, frankly, by middle to the end of May, um, we're going to have the opportunity for almost everybody to have access to the vaccine. So um, a wild ride indeed. And um, again, just fortunate to be able to, to, to utilize, frankly, a lot of skills going back to the University of Richmond, and the leadership school experiences I've had here in Washington all came together basically in a 12 month period. That's fascinating. So you, you said uh, a number of things that will lead me to a couple of follow on questions, but I, I just wanna mention, um, so uh, innovation, um, you know, I'm an economist and, and so I think a lot about um, how people adapt and innovate and are sort of at root entrepreneurial. Um, and what you just described, you know, warp speed sort of sums it up, you know, um, a, a series of innovations that had to take place before you were able to actually you know, do what you needed to do or wanted to do. Um, and, and I guess, um, uh, so I wanted to mention just that word innovation. And secondly, you, you mentioned, um, quoting of course, um, uh, Perina, uh, Army General uh, Perina, uh, mission. You know, so this this has taken on sort of monumental um, proportions, I think, for all of us. Um, and and it feels like you know we're on, and it must feel to you, um, especially like you're on a mission. 
occupied. It's not just that you're, you know, opening your, your another drugstore or whatever, like you're actually doing something that is uh, so important for the entire country. Um, and it's almost, you know, you don't want to give it um, supernatural sort of um, connotation, but it's, it takes on that sort of importance, I think. Um, and, you know, for people like you and me, um, we've never actually lived through a war, or at least to the extent, you know, I grew up in Canada. So, you know, I've never been in a, in a country while it's been uh, at war and I mean, a, you know, a world war. Um, and so this in some sense is the greatest challenge that we've seen in our lifetimes. Um, so again, I just, you don't know, wanna say, you know, thank you for your willingness to be innovative um, and uh, uh, to get this going at, uh, you know, warp speed um, uh, as they call it. Um, I wonder if you could, uh, tell us a little bit, you know, so you, you mentioned um, uh, the presentation. Um, what do you think it was that um, uh, made him, you know, so you, he said, you're ready because, because not so much of the facts, but of your sort of affect. How did he, how did he uh, key into that, do you think, the affect that you and your team put forward? So I would answer that question in a couple of ways. One is, you, you know, you mentioned the word innovation. I, I can, you know, I've tried to spend time thinking back to those months of March and April and May, which frankly are a blur because that was yeah, early on. Sure. We were all going through incredible times. We were all not going to work. We were all, um, you know, faced with um, challenges about testing and illness and folks that yeah. were dying due to a pandemic. None of these things yeah. that were familiar to us. But as part of that, I also remember we would do a lot of back and forth with the federal government and the states. And part of it was we were trying to figure out the solution on how testing would work. And what we, where we eventually arrived as a team, and I tried to arrive at with my leadership team, was we need to tell them the answer. We kept approaching a lot of situations like, what do you think we should do? Here's the different options. Yeah. And where we always ended up was telling them, here's our recommendation. Do you agree? And it was amazing to me that because we were building the airplane, as the phrase has been used many times, as we were flying it, a lot of governors, a lot of legislators, a lot of elected officials, they wanted us to tell them the answer. They wanted us to give a, a sound recommendation mm -hmm. of why we thought this was the best way to stand up COVID testing in a parking lot and which requirements were necessary and frankly, which requirements should be thrown out because we're in the middle of pandemic. Right. So fast forward to the vaccine um, presentation with General Perna, and I think we took a similar approach. They basically said, here's what we envision, how would you do it? And when they said, here's what we envision, that was like a 30 second explanation of what they wanted us to do. And so I was truly amazed at what our operations team put together. And what they basically said is, we're gonna have to start here. We're gonna have to build systems that are tracking things in a way that we've never done before. We're gonna have to start purchasing dry ice. We're going to have to start purchasing sub cold freezers that can handle the Pfizer product, which now everybody's aware of requires these special requirements. Right. And I can still remember texting um, with our executive lead. There's three or four of us that lead have led this for the company. And he said, Ed, I never thought I would be, you know, purchasing what used to look like a college dorm room refrigerator, but is actually a $10,000 ultra code freezer that can hold the life-saving vaccine. So we would kind of giggle about that. And then he'd say, cool, how many you think I should order? I'd say a thousand. We keep moving on. Um, at one point, actually, and I'll get back to your question, I promise, but he, we were trying to decide between two different manufacturers. And this is actually when we are now going back to the White House again this past fall. And I said, look, we should bring a prop right? We should bring something for this event so the media can see what it is we're, we're trying to do to help take all these extra precautions. And he said, well, we're kind of between this one manufacturer and they're not sure if they can deliver the number we need to stand this up. And I said, well, tell them we'll put their particular product in the White House event and all the press that comes with it. And so he called me back two minutes later. He said, Don, they can deliver the exact number we wanted. So, you know, it was kind of that on the fly innovation that you mentioned that right. got us through it. But again, I, I think it was us, Demi, us coming up with our own ideas, our own innovation, our own creativity. Here's how we think we should help administer the vaccine in long-term care facilities and then in store and beyond. And um, they didn't give us a lot of structure and a lot of answers. So we had to figure it out. And I think that's a lot of what, um, what the team appreciated. That's interesting. Yeah, thank you. And I think some of the frustration that people have felt over the last year is that there aren't answers, right? There, there haven't always been answers. And so 
you know, when there's been a press conference or this or that, you know, um, it's not been possible to say with certainty or very, or even with uh, very much precision, you know, what we can expect the next week, the next day, the next hour. Um, uh, and, and, you know, leading with in, in the midst of all of that uncertainty, um, I think just creates, uh, you know, a, a, a enormous challenges. And that's one of the questions I, I did want to ask you about before I get, but before I get to that, um, I, since you've mentioned, um, you know, working with the, um, the federal government, the administration, I, I did want to ask, um, have you, has there been any difference in terms of the, the ability to collaborate, um, given your, your work has now spanned two administrations? Um, so have you noticed anything, you know, that remarkable from uh, the fall to the spring, or is it really pretty much just sort of full tilt ahead under both circumstances? So at the risk of um, trying to not delve into politics. And I'm um, not looking for you to do that. I know, I'm, I'm teasing. <laughs> it, it, look, it's impossible not to, right? When, when we talk about face masks or the vaccine or testing, inevitably it leads back to, you know, ideological differences and everything else. But but the question is, is obviously a fair one and it's an important one. You know, what we were able to do on testing was always done through the lens of how can we help the pandemic? And, you know, I can point to hundreds of people that were working around the clock at Health and Human Services and at the CDC and at a number of other government agencies that never get the attention that they deserve. And all the politics, frankly, didn't matter. Right. Um, you know, as we then got into testing, I would say similar. I, I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to say, here's how the vaccine rollout should have gone. Um, what I would right. argue, and, you know, I could spend a lot of time on this, is um, if there's a way to not devise a system that makes sense, it's to give 67 different jurisdictions in this country the ability to make up their own rules on who's eligible for a vaccine. So we have 50 states, we have the islands, and then we have a handful of big cities that are all considered jurisdictions. In my uh, home state, my birthplace of Illinois, Illinois has is using one vaccine, Moderna, and in the city of Chicago, they're using Pfizer. Now, does anybody think as we try to plan for a pandemic that it makes sense for Chicago embedded in the state of Illinois to each be offering a different vaccine and have different eligibility criteria? W with that in mind, I'll, I'll, I'll fast forward to a question I got from, uh, from somebody on Capitol Hill just a couple of weeks ago, and this was in response to President Biden's um, kind of pledge right after the election right. that he's gonna do 100 million doses in the first 100 mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like that's going to absolutely happen. And the, the individual who was on the other side of the um, of the of the aisle politically said, Ed, "Isn't it fair that that was probably going to happen anyway?" And the answer is yes, that is actually fair. That most of that had already been set in motion. Mm -hmm. But did things change with this administration in terms of trying to probably be a lot more transparent? To your point, and doing a lot of other things intentionally, the answer is absolutely. Um, I, I think the other story I would share is that as the election ended, whatever point different folks want to pick for when that may have occurred, let's call it mid-January, mid-December. Um, we then started interacting with the Biden transition team quite a bit. And they, um, they really wanted to talk to us a lot. And they wanted to understand what we had done, <clears throat> why things had been set up in the manner in which they did. And then they want to talk about the future. What can you do? How many shots? What's your throughput? Mm -hmm. How many stores? How many individuals? How many per day? How many per month? And um, we were doing calls with them <clears throat> on a couple hours notice, and we were getting on with very senior people from the Biden transition. And, you know, this is our job, frankly, to brief these incoming government officials. So we spent a lot of time with them into December into January. We did a call with them for a couple hours on New Year's Day. I think that's, again, another incident where my wife said, wow, this is this is a lot. Um, so the inauguration occurs January 20th. And then yeah. the next days after that, <clears throat> excuse me. Some of my senior execs said, so Ed, have we heard from the Biden folks? And I said, well, it's interesting. When they really needed us, we heard from them a lot. And now there's been a little bit of a pause. Um, to be fair, we've now obviously extended those conversations again. Um, but it is interesting kind of how the, you know, you have to appreciate um, what everybody's goal here is. And right. I think that, you know, if you, if you peel away the political layers, what you really have is a lot of folks deeply committed to trying to make a difference in really short order. That goes to folks that were, you know, working on the appropriations that we needed to fund the free COVID tests. So all the tests that largely CVS, Walgreens, Rite Aid are doing are paid for by the federal government. Um, in some cases, an insurance company will get billed and they'll pay for it. But 
we received over half a billion dollars in funding for those tests. Um, there's a lot of folks that didn't have anything to do with health and human services that helped make that happen, that understood we have to continue to test, we have to continue to scale it. Maybe we've seen a dip for a couple of days, but let's take the long view and know that this holiday is coming up or the Memorial Day is coming up and we better be able to, uh, to, to scale back testing. So um, I, I think and we're seeing the same thing with this administration as well. Um, you know, the challenge is just, frankly, being able to um, try to respond to all the public anticipation for what's next, when do I get mine, and how soon can we get back to normal? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and some of the, the questions that were um, submitted have to do with exactly that, so I, I will get to those. I did want to ask you, though, about leadership challenges, since you're, uh, you were a political science and leadership student uh, at the University of Richmond. Uh, you've been a leader for a, a long time, and now you've gone through this very difficult period. What difficulties and leadership challenges did you face initially, um, you know, in the, in the early phase of the vaccine rollout, um, which did target, as you said, the, you know, healthcare personnel and, and those in uh, long, long-term care facilities? Were there any specific um, challenges that you'd like to mention that you haven't already? Absolutely. You know, it's... Um, I think as you get a little more, as you get a little bit older and you get a little more experience, a lot of kind of life's lessons that were taught to you or shared with you by mentors or parents or relatives or bosses or CEOs all start to come back as you experience them yourself. Um, yourself. And I think a couple of them that come to mind, frankly, are, you know, a true leader um, proves themselves when things are most tough. Um, it's easy to lead in easy times. It's easy to lead when things are going well. It's easy to lead when the company is doing well. People are getting raises. Um, folks are getting promoted. Companies making a lot of money. Um, same could be said for a government position. What, what's hard and what matters is how are you as a leader when stuff's super difficult? Right. When you have a child in the background that hasn't been to school in four days and is super unhappy and crying and you have to get on the phone with the governor or a senior executive and you have to brief that person on a super important issue or else X won't happen in this state. And I can't, there's so many um, incidents I can point to that our entire government relations team at Walgreens, state, federal, policy, political, um, they just work the rear ends off. And so, so that was part of it. You, you, that's when they need you. That's when folks um, frankly need direction. Folks wanna be led to some extent um, they don't want to be rudderless. They want to know where we're going and what's the goal and how do we, and please tell me how to get there. And then I'll take that hill. I, I think the other piece that I, I recall this from late spring into the summer is, you know, at that point you were kind of in this um, adrenaline driven, you know, work environment that usually lasts a couple of days or a couple of weeks. This one lasted months for our whole team and we were thriving on it. But then if you fast forward to this past fall, as we started getting into vaccines and vaccine planning, I could, I could tell being on calls like this, even with, with the team that they were just, they were spent and they were exhausted. We went from doing back in the olden days of, you know, 2019, my team, we would do a full team meeting of roughly two dozen of us once a week. We moved to daily phone calls um, pretty much the second week in March. And we were continuing those for the last seven or eight months. And so um, that's exhausting and taxing, but it was also necessary. And so I would constantly gauge the team. Is this too much? Is it not enough? And what I continued to hear for a while was we need this, Ed. A, because we, we need to know what's going on and there's just so many things we need to resolve on together as a team. But B, I need this kind of eye to eye <clears throat> contact to understand um, and to know that we're going to make it, we're going to be into this. I, I then started turning to um, inspirational quotes for the team. And sometimes I would do political figures, sometimes I would do comedians, sometimes I would do folks that, um, musicians that wrote songs. But I was always typically trying to find something that was a little different to, you know, frankly, have folks recognize that I felt their exhaustion, that I felt their stress, both personally and professionally. Um, you know, sometimes some of my colleagues and others will say, Ed, Ed, that's probably a little too much personal information. But to me, it's important to say, hey, I just had a situation here at home and let me tell you a little bit about it. It was terrible. My kid was a, a stinker and, you know, so-and-so was unhappy with me for this. And then I got in an argument with my boss at the, you know, and <clears throat> I think that's super important for almost all people to understand that, yes, I'm, you're going through the same thing I am. It's no easier right. at your house or wherever else. So, 
so it was it was a lot of that type of sharing um you know i I think this generational divide that you know we spent a lot of time talking about is very real relative to what me as a 1995 graduate of ur goes through versus a lot of folks that um, are either millennials or a little bit older than that and how they view the world what's Mm -hmm. important to them Um, You then overlay the pandemic on top of the political atmosphere and racial equality, all things we were going through as well. And we were going through as a company. So we had stores that were being um, that were being set to set set on fire. We had stores that were being looted. And my team was responsible for figuring out, can we get additional police? Are those stores now closed? Is the city going to be shut down? So we found ourselves in an interesting position where we didn't have a lot of time to reflect personally on the pandemic or on racial equality or on some of these other things happening. And so we would tie to, we would do some timeouts and we would dedicate a meeting. Hey, tell me how you're feeling. Um, you know, tell us what you think of what's going on in the news, which as public affairs professionals and government relations folks, we don't really get to do because we're not supposed to, we're just supposed to kind of execute through it. So I think all of those things were leadership challenges that I recognized some that were happening and then some after the fact. <clears throat> and I, I try to keep in touch with folks as well, just calling them out of the blue, you know, tell me how you're doing on a Thursday afternoon. And I'd hear, <clears throat> you know, Ed, I haven't seen anybody in 12 days. If somebody on my team was, you know, single and living in an apartment in the city or whatever. And Ed, I was supposed to see my family, but my trip got canceled again. You know, those are all things that we all went through, but when you layer on a lot of stress and people working really long hours, it's difficult. So mm-hmm. Um, I tried to challenge myself to do that. And I would also, you know, I'm a big believer in being real. Um, Let's not sugarcoat stuff. Let's not say that everything's great. Let's not say that I'm feeling great today. Things suck. I'm tired. I'm stressed. Um, Let's just be upfront about it uh, because that's how it is. And then if we can make those acknowledgements, hopefully that's going to make somebody else feel a little bit better, um, feel some companionship that somebody else is going through similar. Um, Or yeah, somebody else is working their butt off like I am type of thing, and it's good to hear. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so I had a question about Virginia in particular. Um, uh, about a week ago, Walgreens began offering vac- vaccinations at our pharmacies, and uh, an RTD article uh, wrote that um, you, Walgreens, has promised to distribute nearly half its vaccines to areas uh, with limited medical access and high social vulnerability. Um, something that the CDC uses to gauge whether they uh, need the most support during a public health crisis. I wondered uh, if you could talk about specifically about the challenges associated with getting the vaccines to our vulnerable um, populations. Absolutely. Um, really, really important issue that um, is, is finally getting the attention it deserves. Let me go back to testing for just a moment because it kind of okay. then set, sets the table for what we're trying to be very intentional about on vaccines as well. When we began to stand up our testing sites, excuse me, and we put up a dozen initially, and then we got to about 50 and then 100, we quickly were very focused on where do we put these testing sites where testing is not occurring otherwise? You know, where are there mass um, federal testing sites? Um, And we don't want to be there. We want to be in other areas. Where can we put a testing site that's maybe closer to public transportation? So as we started to scale our sites and we got into three and four and 500 testing sites in the spring of last year, at one point we were at 30, then we ticked up to 40% of all of our testing sites were in medically underserved areas by the definition of the CDC and others. Right. We then kind of held to that and said, let's continue to scale, but let's ensure that those testing sites continue right. to be located in medically um, underserved areas. We did a lot of briefings and continue to do with, you know, both state legislatures, governors, as well as, you know, members of Congress. And we would do a a briefing with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and we'd say, look, here are your congressional districts. Here's the representation of our sites relative to these medically underserved areas. And we'd be very straightforward. As we got into vaccines, it got a little more complicated because you can't just say, well, 40 percent of our stores are in medically underserved areas that are delivering or administering vaccine right now, which is true. The problem is you have folks that are more technologically savvy or have their technology that are stealing those shots um, from some of those particular stores. So what we are doing and have been doing um, at the request of the CDC is we collect race and ethnicity data. 
And we're now reporting that back to the CDC and to the administration to demonstrate very specifically that the shots in arms are going to people of color, going to people of certain race and ethnicities. Right. Yeah. And that's what we're reporting back. The challenge is, however, though, is still twofold, which is significant. One is the vaccine hesitancy. And of course, significant right. hesitancy um, in the African-American community, which has existed for decades for a lot of um, terribly unfortunate reasons that I think a lot of us are familiar with. Um, and you know, we experienced this, experienced this in the long-term care facilities. We went into the long-term care facilities, nursing homes, skilled nursing, yeah. however, there's different types of them. And we were doing both the residents and the, um, the workers. And we saw huge hesitancy among the workers in our first clinic. We started going back for the second clinic to do the second shot, Pfizer and Moderna both required a course. And we were seeing a lot of the staff was then wanting to do it on the second clinic visit because they saw their colleague get the shot and they didn't die. They didn't get sick. They didn't have an allergic reaction. So we can have LeBron James get out there and we can have all kinds of celebrities. And I think some of that's necessary, but part of it is you're gonna be more trusting if your family member, your colleague, your coworker gets the shot and they're okay. So we're still working on addressing that. We also um, have announced a pretty big partnership with Uber, where Uber is going to be providing 10 million free rides for individuals for wherever they live to a pharmacy. Um, Uber, PayPal, and Walgreens have set up a ride fund where we're putting in a roughly another $10 million to also provide additional rides for when the first initial allotment that Uber has allocated. CVS, our big competitor who I don't often say super nice things about, but they're doing something similar with Lyft. So I think we're all trying to be really, really intentional about this. You know, That said, some folks that may be into the weeds on vaccines may have seen yesterday, President Biden actually said, now we want to focus on teachers. Right. Yes. And um, he, he obviously, the goal is to get folks back to school that are already not and everything else. The, the challenge is, you know, then you're kind of pivoting again. All right, so first we were in long-term care. Now we're on vaccine equity. Now you want to whipsaw us and move over here to teachers. Um, all of these populations are important, um, but you kind of kind of work with us on planning a little bit. So right. we, we had a, a very honest conversation with the White House. I did last night and was going back and forth again. I said, look, we're here to help and we're going to do all this. But, you, you know, the president sending out a tweet saying this, it sounds kind of like... Um, you know, you go back and forth about the administration. I said, but you got to help us and give us a heads up so that we can. So he said, right. totally fair point. You guys are doing the shots. We probably should. So it's things like that that you got to, you know, kind of continue to work through. And teachers should be a priority, but we got to balance that on top of some of the other things that 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 sure. are also important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to turn to the pre-submitted questions, but I just before I do that, I, I would like to ask you, um, how are you looking after yourself uh, in this really tough year? Um, <laughs> Uh, so I've, um, for, for most of last spring, the answer was not super well, um, because I was working a great deal and, yeah. um, you know, my relaxation at the end of the day, just to be candid was a bourbon, um, or two to kind of unwind a little bit. I was, I was exercising not much at all. And then as I got into late spring and summer, I started running a lot and, um, actually, um, really enjoyed it to the point where I then hurt myself in the fall yeah. and had to take some time off. But now um, I've, I've tried to be, um, think through a lot more, how do I help myself so that I'm also then a better person at home with my family as well as my coworker. So I'm, I'm back to exercising, um, right. trying to eat a lot better and frankly getting sleep. I mean, you yeah. can, you know, you can work a 14, 16 hour day. You just got to go to bed. You can't then stay up and yeah, yeah, yeah. Netflix or whatever else for two or three hours, even though you probably need that. Um, but it's hard cause I'm still doing a lot of calls at night. And if I get off a call at 9 PM or 9 30, I will then fall asleep, and when I wake up in the middle of the night, I'm I literally have vaccine tables in my head of allotment and allocation for the state yeah. of this and how and it's it's hard to push it out. So you kind of need the TV to try to separate it, but you also need your sleep. So yeah. um, trying trying to do a, a little bit of all those, Sounds and good. a bourbon here and there it helps as well. Just to be honest, <laughs> yeah. I'm not a big bourbon drinker, but maybe someday we'll have one together. <laughs> I would like that. I would like that. That would be wonderful in person. Um, Absolutely. Uh, that would be wonderful. I am a runner, so it's good to hear that you run. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I know. I try. Uh, so, and and, and uh, I'll just say that, um, you know, working at the University of Richmond, not the same responsibility as, as uh, you know, getting the nation vaccinated, but it, it too has been a really challenging year for all of the senior leadership and, and the faculty and staff. Um, and I'm 
I'm just really proud of how we've managed to keep everyone safe at the University of Richmond this year. So, but we too Absolutely. thought we were building the bicycle as we were riding it uh, this <laughs> summer. It was just you know, crazy. So uh, pre-submitted questions. Um, so the first is, uh, I, I think um, on many people's minds, and you alluded to this earlier, but I'll, I'll ask it just to make sure we all hear it again. When will the vaccine be ready for the masses, uh, available to the masses? Uh, you know, I would, um, <clears throat> I would point to President Biden's comments yesterday, where mm -hmm. he has sure. now said that they're very confident there'll be roughly enough doses to vaccinate, you know, 300 million folks by May-ish. Um, I, I think that's that's along the lines of what we were were seeing as well. It's probably had a schedule from what we thought. Um, I think at this point, it's really a matter of um, making sure that folks are willing to get the vaccine, uh, and then you know, um, ensuring. So I think we'll have a lot of progress come this spring and this summer. I think yeah. the challenge that we will all continue to face, and this is a challenge, unfortunately, from the political standpoint as well, is this notion that, all right, you're going to get both shots, you know, Dean Pert, but you still have to wear a mask and you still shouldn't go out and you still shouldn't travel and you still shouldn't do all that. That's really hard for a lot of, you know, Americans to wrap their head around, regardless of political affiliation. And I think having spent a lot of time kind of thinking about this as a company and with our customers and everything else, it's understandable. You know, we've been going through this a year. I finally get the vaccine and what's different. So I think there's some work that needs to be done there, mm -hmm. um, you know, from, for, from a lot of smart people, including Dr. Fauci, about how do we message right. and handle some of that. With that in mind, you know, the couple of variants that folks are reading about, unfortunately, are very real and, yes. um, and they're not good. Yeah. And, you know, the J and J vaccine, I think the media did a really poor job of explaining its efficacy because it was actually up against the variants, whereas the other two were not. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that um, we need to be very, very cognizant of the fact that these variants um, are could not be covered by the vaccine. And so, if we can, if we don't do the things they're telling us to do, it's it's gonna it's gonna be problematic. You know, all these companies are working on a third booster right. shot potentially. Yeah. I think that's going to be important, and then. You know, we, I think the country and the CDC and HHS did a good job last year of scaring folks about the need to get a flu shot because the symptoms for flu and COVID are similar. Mm -hmm. um, us and CVS both did record numbers of flu shots last fall, which mm -hmm. is great because that means it worked. But now we're going to get into probably this next fall and you're going to potentially need both a flu shot and a COVID shot. So what does that look like? Can you combine them? So while there's definitely, you know, uh, I think optimism on the horizon, I think we also have some new, um, some new norms, and we continue to have new norms, of course, of the pandemic, but I think we're going to have some of those coming forward as well. Yeah. So one of the questions that was submitted actually uh, is related to that, which is, uh, you know, how do you envisage the, the future of a pharmacy of Walgreens, um, you know, after we're out of the pandemic? What will be different? What will be the same? So I, I'm hopeful that there, there'll be two two pieces that are that are different. One is I hope that um, a lot of Americans view the role of the pharmacist different, and um, I think that the traditional role of the pharmacist they put pills in a bottle, and as we joke internally, they're really good at counting by fives and tens to put the pills in. I, I think we're hopeful that people are going to look at their pharmacist, and and it's it's funny because you go to your pharmacist if you're on even a medication or two couple times a month in some cases, but at least once a month. You typically see your primary care physician maybe twice a year, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, yet there's not this acknowledgement that your your pharmacist actually probably knows more about some portions of your health. Sure. And so I'm hopeful that between testing and the vaccine and a lot of the other things that pharmacists are not doing, that there will be an understanding that that role the pharmacist has evolved. Um, I think the second thing is, you know, Walgreens was very, very slow to understanding this whole digital world and omni-channel as we refer to it, that, you know, folks want to buy stuff online. And, you know, again, I always bring it back personally and my wife's like, okay, we can go to Walgreens and buy this stuff, but, you know, it could be cheaper here and we're going to get it faster. And I say terrible things then about Amazon and, you know, but we've now had to accelerate a lot of things digitally. Right. We were forced to, we had to. And so I think that experience is going to be a lot different. You can now get your prescription delivered next day for a very small, or same day for a very small fee, next day for free in a lot of cases. You can now go through the drive-through and you can get products. You can get, right. whether it's um, healthcare products or food products, you can get that through the drive-through and you can have all kinds of things delivered. So we have a deal with Instacart. We have a deal with um, a lot of the other delivery services. None of that probably would have happened without the pandemic. Yeah. 
Um, so I, I think that, um, you know, what's not going to change is that, you know, you'll, there's still a lot of people that want to go to the store and either pick out greeting cards or go to the pharmacy and talk to the pharmacists or pick out different products in person. Even that includes the seasonal aisle of Halloween stuff or Valentine's or whatever. That's not going to change. We'll still have 9,9300 stores and we still believe people do want to do that and have that experience. It mm -hmm. just needs to be complemented by the other side of digital, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that word innovation that I used at the beginning, you know, it's been really interesting to see how um, the service industry, which has been decimated, of course, by COVID-19 and, and what we've lived through, uh, but how they've innovated as a result, um, you know, so, so uh, DoorDash and that sort of thing, you know, just sort of emerging and becoming really strong and figuring out ways to make sure that people can live um, somewhat socially, even though we're <laughs> also somewhat isolated. So that's, Correct. A, that's really interesting. Um, uh, one of the questions has to do with the sort of nitty gritty of um, the, the financial model of uh, the vaccine. Um, and you alluded to it a little bit um, earlier on, but, but maybe you can just take people through this so that they sort of understand you know, nothing's free, obviously, but but vaccines are free to us. Um, so so who is paying? What's the cost of the vaccine? Is there profit being made? Um, someone and this is you know I am an economist, so I find it interesting. But it's it's someone else's question. Um, sure. I wonder if you could just kind of explain um, how it works so that we all know you know to whom to be grateful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So let me again go back to the fall, and we you know were approached about doing vaccine administration, had conversations around it. And what we were watching, and I think folks were aware of, of course, at that point is that Operation Warp Speed was spending money, buying yeah. vaccine, yeah. giving money to the pharmaceutical companies to get testing up and running. So then we kind of got into you know November, October-ish, and it became clear that the vaccine or the juice, as we happen to refer to it, was going to be free. Um, and the supplies were largely going to be free. So all the supplies that were needed, the, the needles and the syringes yes. and everything like that, they had purchased yes. that at the time as well. So when we did this meeting with Operation Warspeed, they said, so all that's left is, you know, your administration fee and you'll need to kind of figure out how that works with CMS and all the payers. And we kind of looked at ourselves and said, hmm, so you're kind of taking care of everything else, but not the actual, what we refer to as an administration fee for us to administer the vaccine. Yeah. So similar to the flu, um, and I'm going to use very rough numbers here, but we received somewhere between, call it, you know, um, 14 and $18 to give a flu shot. And that actually includes typically, um, you know, the labor hours and all these other types of things that go into it. And then we maybe make a couple bucks per flu shot. So it's yeah. not like we're having a 50% margin or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. The challenge, of course, with the COVID vaccine is there's far, there's so many more steps involved and time involved, especially yeah. with long-term care facilities, you're traveling on site. But right. backing up from that, we are now, we're, with the flu, you're basically reporting into two different systems, our own internal system, and then a state registry. For the COVID vaccine, we're reporting into Tiberius, we're reporting into a state system, we're reporting into another system, and then we're reporting into our own system as well and we're entering more information. And then on top of that, there are more um, safety protocols that obviously have to be realized with the COVID vaccine than we were doing under the flu. So we ended up going to CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services back in October and kind of put together, here's the cost involved with us administering a flu shot. And then here's the Delta for us to administer the vaccine. And fortunately, they, they came back um, with a recommendation um, slash the payment for Medicare and said, here's what we're gonna pay you. We're gonna pay you roughly um, $17 for the first shot if it's a two dose. And then we're gonna give you um, roughly $27 for the second, averaging somewhere around $22, $23. Um, it, it's never as much as you wanted as an industry, but it, we felt it was reasonable. And then if it was one shot, it would be $27, $28. But you know, as an economist and as, a healthcare, as healthcare folks that are potentially listening, it's a little odd that you're gonna then, you know, you're paying you less for the first shot and more for the second. The goal, of yeah. course, is to get people to come back. What yeah. you also want to be careful, though, is that folks don't get the first shot at Walgreens and then all go to CVS to get the second shot. And that there's yeah. not incentives in place for CVS to steer everybody for their second shot. So you got to be... Right, right, right. But in addition to that, as we're all aware, we have a very disjointed um, healthcare system and we have multiple payers. So we were super proud of the work 
my team did on getting that federal payment. Well, then you go to the commercial payers, all the big insurance companies who similarly are only obligated to cover the administrative fee for the shots for their folks that are insured. Right. And so our contracting people said, well, Ed, that's great, but now you got to make sure that the commercial payers are going to agree to the Medicare rate or it's going to bleed over and lower. And I said, hey, look, I'm the, we're the government folks. That's your job. In addition, all 50 states then have a Medicaid reimbursement rate for Medicaid patients, which right. is different from the Medicare. So we then had to get what's called a SPA, a state policy amendment or state plan amendment in almost all 50 states because by law, they, if they couldn't just pay us for the flu amount, they had to get a, we had to file a SPA in each of the states, go through the governor in order to get that payment above. So yeah. the long and the short is we're getting roughly $22 per shot if it's a two shot dose, and we're making about $28 if it's a one shot dose. Um, are we making a profit? The answer is yes. Um, you know, we, we did our, <clears throat> excuse me, end of quarter earnings, we'll have another one coming up. This is not something that's going to completely turn around the face of, the, you know, put the company in a very different direction financially. Um, it's the same thing with testing. It's something that we got into knowing that we needed to make a little bit of money on it because we're a for-profit entity. Um, you know, we're a publicly traded company. We have an obligation. But to the same extent, this isn't something, again, where you're seeing, you know, at, at 20, 30, 40 percent profit margin. on it. Right, right. That's fascinating. Thank you. Um, I'm still, you know, as someone who grew up in uh, Southern Ontario, I'm still fascinated by the healthcare system that we have in the United States. Um, it's just so, so different. We have lead, European leadership and parts of our company, Walgreens Boots Alliance, is the parent, and they have similar oh, yeah. views. Like they yeah. can't admit, they can't believe how many and the complexity and how many different payers and everything else. It's right. Yes. Um, and one of the questions was uh, similarly sort of detailed, so I'm going to ask it as well, one of the submitted ones, um, and, and it has to do with how one gets pulled off the list. Um, so, so the, the uh, person who wrote in said, what's the role of the state database in making it scheduling calls, which lists are pulled from first, local, pharmacy, state, those with question marks after uh, all of those. I wonder if you could just describe the mechanics of how you know, someone who's over 65, who's registered, um, gets chosen at this point or find, you know, gets the call. <laughs> yeah, so we have, we have 12 minutes left, so I'll yeah, try to yeah. make this short. Uh, <laughs> this goes back to complexity. So I think the easiest way is that there's two different sets of allocation. There's federal allocation and there's state. Yeah. So starting in late December, all the states received phase 1A state allocation, which yes. then they were able to give to their healthcare workers, health right. systems, hospital yeah. systems. As they burned through a lot of their healthcare workers, then a lot of those state allocations were still going to the hospitals and health systems and still are, and they are calling some of their patients who are eligible in the state. Got it. And sometime then around late January, they ended up pushing, moving forward what they call the Federal Pharmacy Partnership Program, which is Walgreens, CVS, Kroger, Walmart, everybody else. Yeah. And they started sending us federal allocation that we then were are continuing to use in store through our own scheduler. Yes. So depending on the state and depending on the eligibility requirements, you could be able to get a shot based on eligibility through the state allocation at a public type of entity or even a private healthcare system, or you could come on and go on a Rite Aid or Walgreens appointment scheduler, find an appointment and, and be able to get your shot that way. Got it. Got it. Okay, so we are getting close to the end of our time, and I want to be mindful and, and close uh, at seven o'clock. So final question, and I, I love this one. Um, what's the accomplishment of which you're most proud during the, this past year, and uh, what do you wish you could go back and do better? Hmm. Probably wish I would have seen that question so I could have given it <laughs> even more thought. It is a good one. What am I most proud of? I, I, I think that... Um, I think I'm most proud of probably two pieces. One is the work, and you mentioned this earlier. You know, some folks spend their whole life looking for that um, purpose-driven mission, goal, objective that they really want to kind of sink their teeth into and make a difference. And, you know, I think my whole team and I had that opportunity where we were presented with responding to a pandemic and standing up COVID testing to save lives. You know, it's kind of the old adage, what are you, why are you so busy at work? What are you doing carrying cancer? And, you know, it's an inappropriate joke, but nonetheless, we would right. look at ourselves most days and say, this is this is pretty important stuff. Um, and that helped drive us. And so um, I'm super proud of the fact we're about to hit 5 million tests. That's incredible. Um, I remember when we had 12 sites and it was terrible and it was painful and it was 
super difficult. And now we have testing at 4,000 Walgreens around the country. I'm super proud of that. Uh, and then I'm super proud of the fact that we've now played the role that we have on vaccines and have worked through a really, really complex process in the middle of the worst transition in presidential history of two administrations. Um, that's an objective statement. It's not, a, it's not a political statement. And we've been able to do that in a way where we're still very much um, able to, you know, administer the vaccine and we can now see the light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm, I'm proud of those two pieces, but I'm frankly probably most proud of the work the whole team continues to do because everybody's still in doing what they were 10, 11 months ago and recognizing how important it is and working long hours and working through the weekends. And, you know, I'm, I'm begging folks to take time off. I'm begging folks to take a vacation day, take a half day or whatever. And they're pushing back saying, I'd love to add you, you telling us we can means a lot because you recognize how hard we're working, but I still need to do push and X, Y. So I'm, I'm equally proud of all the work the team's done. Great. Um, anything you would redo? What would I do different? <laughs> wow. Uh, what would I do different? You know, I, I enjoy reading books on leadership. I enjoy reading books on um, history, political figures, um, biographies, autobiographies. And I think I would have, if I, 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 it's not realistic that I would have done this to be clear, but I wish yeah. I could have kept some better notes about what we had done over the last 11 months. Mm -hmm. I have emails, of course. Yeah. Um, and I've worked with somebody in my office to try to put some of those pieces together. And um, I've been asked to do a couple classes here in Washington, do a couple of the, the graduate programs, and that's been great. I want to do some more of that so that a lot of everything, all this that has transpired should have an impact on the pharmacy profession moving right. forward. It should have an impact on, frankly, leading during a crisis. It should have an impact on how to how advocacy can be done mm -hmm. in effective ways and what didn't work. So I wish I would have kept a better tally in real time on a lot of those things. You read about President Obama taking these copious notes throughout his presidency where he's now writing these huge volumes. I, I just don't know how he had the time and the energy to do right. something like that because yeah. you're so exhausted and you're going through it. The last thing you want to do, I want to do at the end of the day is then sit down and let me spend some time rehashing everything that just happened. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I hope you will have time to write down your thoughts and, and reflect a little bit and, and you know, write a memoir or something <laughs> uh, or take some classes come to perhaps to the Jepson School and, and uh, you know, talk with our students or to the university writ large and, and talk. Well, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be honored to. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been absolutely fascinating. I want to thank you again for both for, you know, the work you and your team have done over the last year um, and, and which, as you say, has saved countless lives, uh, but also for taking the time tonight. And I know you've got it, you know, a million other things that you could be doing. Um, so thanks very much, Ed. It's been a real well, joy. Thank you for the invitation. It's been an absolute honor and uh, appreciate the conversation tonight. And like you said, hopefully we can either uh, talk to some students in person and or have a bourbon in person. So I thank you. I would love that. I, I would definitely love that. Um, for those of you who have been watching this, this evening, let me just thank you for tuning in. Um, I'd like to remind you to like us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, uh, whether it's the Jepson School or you are the, the uh, University of Richmond alumni um, group, please go ahead and check out what events are coming up in the future. There are all sorts of uh, alumni um, uh, events uh, ahead. And so let me just uh, close the program by saying thanks very much and go spiders. Go spiders. <laughs>